Well, welcome back to Liquid Lunch. Uh, it's me, Hugh, and Dan is here today. And uh, Dan, you're really liking the sound of your own voice. I'm really, I'm humbly um, grateful to the powers above for this voice. See, it's now, when you really get into it, then you just start to become a totally different person. <laughs> yes, hopefully, God, With, I hope I don't turn into a persona of myself. So, Well... Let's get busy, shall we? Yes. We have our yes. uh, guest Ray Rivers here, and yeah. uh, Ray, great to have you on the show. Thank you. And nice to be here. How's your your voice sounding? Uh, I don't it's, know. Uh, it sounds pretty good. Okay, great. So, anyway, you're the author of this book, The End I of September. Am. Yep. And you do a lot of other stuff I do. Uh, that we're finding out uh, just yep. before you came on the show today. But yep. um, um, it's an exciting looking uh, book. I'm seeing a firecracker on the front jacket of that book. And that starts a whole. Do you like remember those? Right there, do you remember know. those uh, firecrackers? The firecracker in the in the Canada Post mailbox. That's right, right, Ray. That's right. It was the FLQ. Those in were the good the, old days. In the sixties and uh, and into the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and where were you living at that time? I was in uh, Toronto area. Okay. Yeah. And um, so now this book is all about the uh, those separatist uh, days in Quebec this or. Yeah, this book is a historical fiction, so there's a lot of fantasy in it. But it starts off uh, in 1980 when René Lévesque held his <coughs> uh, first referendum, uh, his only referendum, on Quebec separatism, the Sovereignty Association, he called it. And in the book, uh, as we recall, in 1979, <coughs> Pierre Trudeau had lost his uh, election, his last election, and the government had changed. Joe Clark had come in. Uh, as prime minister for the conservatives, and uh, he was a uh, he was running a uh, had very very little support from Quebec, mm -hmm. and Reddy Levesque wanted to get his referendum in while Clark was prime minister because he thought that he had a better chance of winning it. So Trudeau came back. Uh, the budget fell uh, in 1979, and uh, Trudeau came back in, became prime minister again, and Reddy Levesque had the referendum with Trudeau in, and uh, and of course Levesque lost. Mm -hmm. So in my story, what happens is that uh, Trudeau doesn't come back. Clark doesn't, his government doesn't fall. It continues on. They hold the referendum, and this time the referendum wins. Oh. And so oh. the story goes from there. And then we go up to the year 2000, which is when Pierre Trudeau died at the end of September, and thus the title, uh, in 2000. And, and the story takes place, really, the main story, over the four days from uh, his death until his funeral and all that action happens. What you have is a, uh, without giving it away, because I want people to read it, <laughs> is a resurgence of the FLQ through that whole period. You mean after Trudeau dies? After the referendum in 1980 because the, uh, because the <coughs> referendum wins, but right. Canada refuses to negotiate oh, okay. with René Levesque on Sovereignty Association, which is what he wanted. Whoa. And so, so the FLQ feels so that they have to do uh, whatever. So this is a real... Uh, it's a political intrigue. It's a political intrigue. It's a thriller. It's uh, it's meant to uh, to make people think about an issue that's really important and it's germane today. Uh, well, yeah. Bring, bring us back to uh, if I may jump back to before the setting of your story, which may have inspired you a little bit. I'm not sure. I was a kid, but in the '60s, where that chap was an MP was kidnapped and he was unfortunately that's right. killed. Yeah. That Fear kind of suspense intensity is maybe without. Give, I don't have even read the book, so. It might be infused in there, I guess. It's uh, it's it's very much, and there is yeah. history that, that that does talk about that whole period about the uh, early days of the FLQ. Uh, in the book, the FLQ is reconstructed; it comes back again because what we recall is that in October 1970, uh, the FLQ crisis hit Canada. Right. Pierre Trudeau was <coughs> prime minister, and uh, he introduced the War Measures Act, brought the army into Montreal. That's right. That's right. And uh, he was criticized for that by some people, but also yeah. applauded by everybody. There was yeah. a, the House of Parliament uh, unanimously supported him uh, going in with the uh, War Measures Act. Uh, and they, they, they got rid of the organization, the FLQ. I mean, it's one of the success stories in yeah. terms of looking at terrorist organizations that it didn't linger on like it doesn't so it did in so many other places, doesn't so many other places. But it I don't, was extinguished. I don't want to digress too much, <laughs> but just for one second, yeah. what what caused them to do what they did, the FLQ back then? There, like here in your story, I'm trying to make a connection. There, there was a situation where there's a uh, the referendum did succeed, and there was the negotiation did not work out or something and then the FLQ 
decide to step in and cause trouble. What caused the, the tr what was the cause the trouble that caused the FLQ to go into action and and cause the in unfortunate the passing of yeah in, in, in the, the first place, place? In, life? in the first place well there, there were a couple things one is that Quebec came out of a long sleep uh, and and the book does talk about that the history part of the book talks yeah. a bit about that because yeah. Quebec was in this long sleep where the Catholic Church was predominant in the lives of all Quebecers mm -hmm. and they very much were taught to not really be very rabble rousing kind of people mm -hmm. right. but they had this this whole liberalism that <coughs> happened uh, with uh, with Jean Lesage back in the early 60s oh, I and see. part of that coming out of that was also this sense of awareness mm -hmm. it was the 60s thing. Yeah, it was the 60s too I mean they 60s. were male the bombs and mailboxes all over the world and oh. in the states you had the huge marches on the uh, against the war yeah. in Vietnam can't and state the, the whole thing yeah, yeah, yeah the whole the whole 60s right, right, uprising right, free right. love era and, and all in that France stuff. too there was uh, riots in France the youth Absolutely. were uh, oh, okay. so, so it just uh, timed in with everything else but the FLQ in those days was was a very hardline organization it was bent on 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 creating a socialist uh, communist uh, enterprise in Quebec and taking over the lives of Quebecers that way. It was it had been trained by the uh, Palestine Liberal uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization, which at that time was a was a terrorist organization right. long before it changed. So it it was pretty hard line. There were links to the uh, Russian KGB uh, mm -hmm. and some suspect even the French Foreign Legion had some linkages in there. So well, there was a lot of Paul Rose. Didn't he go to Cuba after he did, the? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, you're on top of this. And he's on top of everything. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. Uh, if they took over, would it? Um, would is, um, were they into complete francophonism or something? Like everything had to be in French or something? Or well, it wasn't. It wasn't strictly uh, the, the original FLQ wasn't strictly a language or culture thing. It, yeah. it, it was more to do with uh, with economic systems, okay, financial enough. enterprise. So they yeah. were a real re rebellion, rebellious organization that was right. looking to change Quebec into yeah. a uh, into a modern socialist state. Mm. Which brings us back to. This, it was uh, they stepped in. Uh, they stepped in because of just the friction that was going on with, without giving the story away. Or am I giving? <laughs> no, no, we, you're not we, giving the story. We, no, uh, the. Uh, so in my book, what yeah. happens is that uh, when the referendum, uh, when, when Levesque wins the referendum in 1980, yeah, uh, he comes to Canada, to the rest of Canada, and says, "I would like to negotiate sovereignty association," but. The government at the time says we're not going to do that. We don't think that it's a legitimate referendum. We, you know, we're we're questioning uh, what you mean by sovereignty association. Do people even understand it? Some of the questions that came up in the uh, 90, 1995 referendum. Right. And sorry, who's the prime minister in the book at the time? Joe is Clark. Joe Clark yeah. does not want to negotiate sovereignty will association. Not, will because not be okay. allowed to negotiate because his argument is that even though the people voted for the in the referendum. They didn't know what they were voting for, I guess, yeah. according to Clark. Yeah. They were voting they were for a whole other bill of goods. We, we still don't really understand what was meant by sovereignty association. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so there were a lot of reasons why uh, Canada would not just automatically jump on and start to negotiate uh, uh, independence for a province based on a, a referendum. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, so, so, so what happens is then you have a period of conflict that happens from then until the year 2000. And it's that that conflict is uh, is is underlying, and in 2000 it comes to a head. So if you want to think about it, it's another October 1970 crisis that happens in the period in Trudeau's passing, rather than in his living. Boy, it's um, it's interesting to think what might have happened if that referendum had gone exactly. the other way. Exactly. And even the last one was w the one in the 90s was Squeaker. so close. Yeah. I remember. Uh, it was just, uh, I mean, it, it, we came this close to losing the country. And I think that's the story. I mean, the story, what kept us from losing the country was the love. I think when we had all of those people <coughs> and people across the country expressing their love for Quebec, I think that's what allowed us to actually win that referendum. Well, <coughs> hold on. There could be one other little thing called money. It's that um, the economy on Quebec... Sorry, did I get the, co the economy in Quebec? Um, is strength? Its strength is we, we all knew as 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 uh, inclusive with the other provinces. It's a whole another entity to the uh, to the you know to the uh, eurozone or whatever in trade or whatever uh, with this uh, tenuous 
new currency for Quebec or whatever they're going to do, or maybe they're going to use the same currency, but it was a separate country. And people's stocks and people's investments may just drop because yeah, of the no change. Question. Absolutely. You know, I mean, sure, that, that that's absolutely true. But I, I think I think fundamentally that, that, that it, there's something about nationalism, about patriot, patriotism, where people, it's the emotional thing as opposed to just the money. I mean, I yeah. absolutely write about the money, I, you know. Yeah. But I think that people also feel strongly about it. I think when people saw that they were wanting to be part of Canada. Yeah. So I think what happens is we go through a period where we, we have this this, 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 this passion that we show, mm -hmm. and then we kind of let it lie. You know, think of it as a marriage, you know? I mean, a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, provinces within this federation are kind of like, you know, uh, a marriage, the English and French Canada, in a sense. And if you ignore them, if you let it, mm -hmm. if you don't pay attention, yeah. mm -hmm. that, that marriage might start to get weakened. And I think that's what happened, and that's what continues to happen over the well, period. So writing the book, yeah. Part of the reason why I wanted to write the book was because I feel very strongly that we need to continue to have an ongoing uh, expression of our national unity, of mm -hmm. our desire to, to keep Quebec as a fully functioning partner. And I think that's what Quebecers want. It's like a marriage. Well, if, yeah. Well, Go ahead. Let, sure. let me hear my argument. <laughs> let me, I'm listening, Dan. Right. <laughs> but if, if, if we have our plays back and forth here. If... Um, a marriage someone told me it has no arguments and says oh we never argue the marriage doesn't last at all if if there is this friction going on but you talk it out these are perfect marriages yes. and so this is what this yeah, is yeah I, I, I think that's absolutely insightful absolutely right yeah. yeah that that's my view of it anyway except i think quebec might want an open marriage <laughs> well <laughs> there, there, there are differences and uh and, and i you know but I think I think I think in the end it comes down to an expression of being an equal partner in the yeah. in the federation. So it's really important when we have, you know, today we have a, a government that has very little support from Quebec. Yeah. So putting it into modern political terms, uh, we, I think we have to be particularly careful yeah. that we do not affront uh, Quebecers on some things that are really okay. key. Now let me give you an example. One of those was the uh, you know we renamed the military uh, royal, you know, and. Few things rile mm -hmm. Quebecers more, I think, than the sense of, of regal, you know, authority or, or coming back to Britain. Right. You know, the whole sense of independence uh, is very, uh, very important to Quebecers. Yeah. And uh, do you ever get the uh, sense, the sense that uh, the government, maybe the current government, is is really not interested in keeping the country <coughs> together? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't go that far, but okay. I think, I think, I think. You know, as in a marriage, you can sometimes neglect, mm -hmm. and I, I would yeah. think it's more a case of, uh, of neglect and omission rather than uh, than mm -hmm. deliberately going out to, uh, to to not care about keeping the country together. I mean, they, they did do things earlier. There was this whole declaration of Quebec being a nation. Yeah. So I think it was really an intent to to try to do that. But but I mean, there are these other things that are happening. Well, the Bloc Québécois is gone. A lot of people are saying, well, we don't have to worry about Quebec independence anymore. It's gone. I don't think that's true. I think all we've really had is, is a brief moment. Yeah. And we need to capture right. in that moment the things that will make Quebec understand <coughs> that there is a new place for it in Canada. Well, I, I yeah. think I agree there's, uh, you know, it could, the whole thing could arise again at any moment. You've yeah. got that whole PQ political structure in place that could I instantly become the BQ at a federal level or some kind of equivalent. Um, some you know, little small storm can turn into a hurricane. Well, I mean, I've seen it in the weather. Well, we saw it with Lucien Bouchard. I mean, where did that come <coughs> from? It's been <coughs> explained to me that about a third of Quebecers have always been wanting to see an independent Quebec, independent and sovereign from the rest mm. of Canada. About a third really would like to see Quebec continue to be a partner in a Canadian federation where it's an equal partner, and the uh, and the other uh, third probably have other and more important things to do in their lives and don't think about nationalism so much yeah. in Quebec. So, so I think it's, it's if we can cons convince that other third that Canada is in their best interest in, in the United Canada. Is there something somewhere that, two questions, is there something somewhere that's un that makes Quebec, it's agreed that it's a unique in its culture that uh, satisfies some of the Quebecers? Like, it's almost saying that they're separate, but yet they're part of one, that they're there's a certain uniqueness in the culture and that the rest of Canada respects that? Or is there some clause that says that or no, not really? 
Not really. Okay. Not in the Constitution, per se. And I think okay. one of the reasons... I mean, Le- Levesque, as you know, didn't, uh, when he was Prime Minister in the Canada's yeah. Constitution, which has all been in the news because yeah. of the 30 years of the Charter, uh, but one of the reasons he didn't sign that was because he had come in on a separatist platform, <laughs> on a sovereignist platform, yeah, yeah, and he yeah. couldn't possibly sign the Constitution, no matter almost what was yeah, in it. Yeah, right, right. But clearly, uh, some recognition of Quebec's special role yeah. as a cultural identity that is different than mm-hmm. that of the rest of Canada. Uh, my other question is, uh, it's not exactly real time, but it's pretty close, four days in a book. You know, books span years, a story, or, or even beyond that. So you did it in, the story is in four days. To me, that's sort of like real time. So it's like one of Dostoevsky's, one of the top books, uh, I think the Kovzlomov Brothers, I'm not even saying that right. Karamazov. Thank you so much. There is the Mr. Inform right there. Uh, one of his better books. And uh, it seems like it really works. What, what inspired you to do the four days? Well, it's a period in which um, it's a period in which Trudeau's passing and oh, from there. his okay. funeral yeah. is 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 the four days, and it and and Trudeau, of course, features through the book. You know, mm-hmm. The book's actually dedicated to both Trudeau and uh, René Levesque, okay. because I think that they both played a huge part in keeping Canada together yeah. up until today. They were like two dancing partners. Well, we were th- all watching the dance. I think what Levesque did was Levesque convinced Quebecers after the fall of the FLQ, after it had been ground to the ground, that they didn't need to use armed insurrection to get what they wanted mm-hmm. from the union with Canada. Mm-hmm. And that, and I think it was his, the way he brought in, because he was a tremendously political liberal, and he brought in, and I'd be used liberal in the general sense, and he <coughs> brought in that sense that you can achieve what you want through political means. And mm-hmm. the ballot box, mm-hmm. and I, th- I so so. I, and he I, was a true Democrat. He was. He totally respected Absolutely. the results yeah. of the referendum. And and many, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I mean, uh, a lot of the people that I know in Quebec, they 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 have nothing but praise for for Levesque for mm-hmm. all the other good mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. You, you may not agree. One may not agree with Levesque, but he's a very likable guy. From what oh. I understand. Yeah. And he had uh, wonderful, friendly uh, discussions with. Trudeau, I think it went on. Like they would debate well, they used to work other. together, didn't they? Or they, they debated. They, each other. They, no, they, they never... Re- I don't think they ever really got along. Oh, I, I okay, think okay. They, they were always on the other ends of the debate. They always <laughs> had disagreements, huge disagreements. And Trudeau was... Uh, I recall there was a number of labor issues and other things oh, in which Trudeau was also involved in. And, and there, were, there were some major disagreements between them. But And, and of course, they, they disagreed through the whole period when uh, Levesque was premier and, uh, and, uh, and mm-hmm. Trudeau was prime minister. So... And, Hey Ray, listen. I, you got the book here, and I know you want to read a passage. I do. And let's uh, let's. Uh, could you do that for us? Sure. We'll have to sink our teeth into this. Okay. okay. Let me do a let me do a little passage. This is uh, near the end of the book. It's actually on the day of the funeral, and it's happening in Montreal. Mm. The, the book, by the way, is set in uh, Ottawa and Montreal. So this is from Ottawa. It's called the Basilica. The dignitaries had started arriving for the funeral and the security officers were already all over the streets fronting on and around the basilica. RCMP officers had closed and were diverting traffic from Rue Notre Dame, which fronted the basilica. Fortunately for the mourners, clear skies and a brilliant October sunshine took some of the sadness out of the air on this solemn day and facilitated the tasks of the officials responsible to make sure everything went to plan. The mourners were mostly congregating on the lawn in Place d'Armes, the famous park opposite the Basilica. They had arrived in taxis or cars, which they had to park several blocks away. Some were looking at the old church, admiring its magnificent architecture. Others were reminiscing about those good old Trudeau days, chatting niceties to one another and allowing time for the various security services to do their job in preparation for the funeral service. The RCMP were re-examining the old church building for the third time in the last two days, to reassure themselves that they had not missed anything. They had set up rope lines to accommodate processions later that day and to ensure that their security net would prevent any known terrorists from entering the old church to cause havoc. Place d'Armes has been called the cradle of Montreal history, a statue of Paul de Chaumont, Sieur de Maisonneuve, and founder of the city of Montreal dominate this public place, which is set out in the tradition of the great European city squares. De Chaumont's statue had been erected in 1895, replacing a bust of King George III. American invaders during the U.S. Revolutionary War of Independence had decapitated the statue, but it had decided to finally replace it 
after angry British residents further vandalized it on the pronouncement of the 1774 Quebec Act, which gave new powers of self-government to French Canadians. Today there was a human angel at de Maisonneuve's metal right hand, in the middle of the public square, just beneath his image. She was an impressive figure of a woman in a glorious full-length red gown and wearing a stunning red fur fox jacket. Standing on an old milk crate, she rose above the other visitors to the park, hidden by her long skirt, and the milk crate was a red plastic four-liter jerry can. And beside her was a large sign, about the size of a sheet of bristle board, with blood-red handwriting on a white background. La société est juste commence avec la liberté. She stood quietly, mostly ignoring the people gathering in the square, but only a blind man could have missed her presence. Still, few people took the time to glance at her or the sign by her side. Even the police officers, who were abnormally cautious this day, were leaving her alone. She was neither panhandling nor begging, and no one would have suspected her to be a security threat, given her magnificent appearance. Perhaps the authorities just imagined her to be a flamboyant Trudeau supporter coming to pay her last respects. After all, Trudeau had loved flamboyant ladies. All of a sudden she began to sing without accompaniment in a voice that obviously had seen vocal training where she could be clearly heard even above the din of the chatting crowd. As she sang, she throttled her words in the style of the great Edith Piaf. Except she wasn't singing about the streets of Paris. Her words had been taken from the famous Gilles Vignon song, Mon Pays. Canada's National Film Board had commissioned the song for the film Le Neige a Fondu sur le Manic Wagon in 1964. It's moving imagery about winter time in Quebec and the Brotherhood of Québécois evoked powerful emotions among Canadians, Québécois in particular. It had been taken by the early FLQ as their theme song, although Vigneault denied that had ever been his intention. Mon pays, ce n'est pas un pays, c'est l'hiver. Her powerful, angelic voice carried across the square and the crowd gathered around her, watching as if hypnotized by this beautiful woman and her compelling vocal instrument. She finished the song, then pulled out her cell phone from her jacket pocket and speed dialed the number. Once it had been answered, she began speaking loud enough for the crowd to hear, Allo, mon chéri, you have loved me more than I deserve and I will take the memories of our times together with me wherever I go. Monsieur Trudeau, please wait for me. Neither of us found true justice in our lifetimes, but maybe we will in the afterlife. Adieu, mon amour. Please do not mourn for me. I have no regrets. She closed the phone and dropped it to the ground. Two policemen from the crowd control detail, who had been watching her intently, started to approach her. But she gestured for them to stay back. Then this elegant woman in the long, gorgeous red gown and fox jacket lifted her hands to the sky and broke into a version of the greatest of all of P.F.'s songs. No, je ne regrette rien. She belted out before the crowd of mourners, who had now fallen completely silent. She would have made P.F. proud with her vocal efforts, singing a cappello, as she invited the crowd of mourners in front of her into her soul. Her eyes and her sad smile had found a way into their hearts such that nobody wanted to stop gazing. The crowd had become completely spellbound as they watched this elegant woman in silence and listened to her every lyric. Even Anglophones, who possessed no comprehension of the French language, found themselves fighting back the inevitable tears which would be expected of them later on this most emotional day. The first verse was followed by the refrain and then Almost as if it were part of the song, she lifted the red can hidden by the milk crate and tipped it over her shoulders and onto herself. The crowd could now smell gasoline fumes and began to stir, breaking their earlier trance but still not dispersing. The police clearly were now ill at ease and wanting to approach her, though they were unsure exactly how to proceed. Finally, she stopped them in their tracks by pulling out a barbecue lighter from somewhere and pointing it at them. Then she turned the lighter on herself and clicked the trigger. Her dress and jacket burst into flames as if on cue to accompany her singing out of the last refrain. She must now have been in pain, but this amazing chanteuse continued with her song, never missing a word, and powerfully driving home the lyrics, even as she was being forced to the ground in a ball of flames. The crowd, which now included everyone in the square, might have applauded, except for the horror of it all. Everything had happened so quickly that they just stood there in stunned silence. In the distance, the sound of the fire engines could be heard screaming as if they were adding their own harmonies to accompany this gifted vocalist in her magnificent swan song. There was nothing the police could do but watch and wait for the firemen to come and extinguish the last of the flames 
which were now just taking their last licks of her body. Someone had passed a fire extinguisher to one of the policemen, but by the time he could get near enough to use it, there was no longer any point she was gone. Before long, the mourners started to move into the church, and the hearse carrying Trudeau arrived amid firemen, firemen, policemen, ashes, and the remains of a makeshift sign. About 3,000 people attended the service in the basilica, and several thousand more stood outside. The choir sang. The archbishop gave the invocation. The eulogies were delivered. Finally, everyone sang O Canada, and Trudeau was laid to rest in his beloved Montreal. There was a lot of music sung that day, but nobody attending the funeral would ever forget the words of the poignant chanson recorded by Edith Piaf in 1960. She had dedicated the song to the French Foreign Legion, and it has come to represent liberation and freedom ever since that time. I have nothing to regret. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. So, uh, sounds good. Sounds well written. Thank you. Which is, um, well, I won't name names, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it, and, uh, and I, I will give you this copy as well, Dan. So. No, you're yeah, doing enjoy. a book launch. Uh, We've got uh, a book launch in Burlington, uh, May the 6th, Sunday. This is coming Sunday at okay. uh, 2 to 4 in the, uh, one of my favorite uh, independent bookstores, uh, A Different Drummer, on uh, Loka Street in Burlington. And uh, they have a website. You can just go for A Different Drummer, and you'll find out where it is. And we'd love to see you out there, 2 to 4. I've got some music uh, playing. Good friends of mine, John and Sheila Ludgate, are uh, bringing their mm. instruments and, uh, and and giving us a little entertainment. What, what day is that on? I'm sorry. It's a Sunday. Sunday, 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 Sunday. Yeah, I'd love to see you out there. Come on out. No, are they going to be doing uh, material that's somehow complimentary uh, to the book? Like they, John suggested that they might do something, not necessarily with the book, but uh, but in, in terms of literature, because yeah. they're going to be in a, in a lovely setting. The different, uh, different Drummer is a wonderful place to launch a book. It's a nice little, very uh, compact. Are you familiar with Page's Bookstore when it was here in, on, in, on Queen Street yeah, in Toronto? Yeah. Is it like that, yeah. this place? Okay, Pretty much, yeah. yeah. No. Not, not, not very big, though. Not as no, big. No, it's Berlin. Okay. So is the book just newly out? The book's just newly out. It's, uh, it's on e-reader. Uh, so all of the e-reader locations have, uh, have have a copy of it. So you can go to Sony, iTunes, uh, Kindle, mm. Barnes and & Noble. And get it on your little electronic reading device. It, and you can go to Amazon.ca and you can order it there. And it's uh, it's available from Amazon uh, as well. And uh, and it's in uh, Different Drummer. It's in Brian Prince in Hamilton, uh, another independent bookseller. Uh, Book City here in Toronto has got copies. And uh, and I'm going to be doing a uh, another signing at Chapters in Burlington in about a month. Now, are you? Um, is this your first uh, book? Uh, I I wrote I've written a lot of nonfiction most okay. of my life. I've, yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I this is my first novel. Okay. And so I'm really excited about it. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And it sounds like it's really exciting. Um, the story sounds... Uh, I know sounds when she brought out the can, I went, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I heard that, I said, oh, this is where it's going. Oh, no. Poetic, but disastrous. Yeah. Well, as a, as a, you know, the, the writing's got to be different these days. Like, did you publish this yourself? or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I, I just, it just, it's. Did you try? I, I wanted to get it out. I, I've been. I, I went and talked to a couple of publishers, and uh, they said it's a nice idea, but you know, um, it's it's tough we're, out there. But, in the we're, busy. We're, yeah, but we're, we're busy. We're busy. We're busy. It's, like, we it's, it's <laughs> tough out there in the publishing world, and and you know, it takes a long time to actually take a book through the whole publication process. Yeah. If you go with a regular publisher, you could be a year and a half to two years before you get a book through. Plus, this way you get to keep more of the money. Right, absolutely right. <laughs> Why a year or two before the book goes through just the process? Uh, they just it? have processes and procedures, oh, and you know uh, whether it's uh, you know, Clellan Stewart or uh, or whoever they, you, you, if you, it, it takes a while to get the book through that process. But it almost seems like you don't need to do that. No, anymore. you don't. No, people uh, self-publish all the time now. Yeah, and uh, uh, an old friend of mine Mar from a previous life, Mark Twain, uh, had his bo one of his books was self-published. I think before I don't know if it was yeah. Huckleberry Finn or what. Yeah. And then it was picked up later. I mean, it's a pain because you have to distribute it yourself. <laughs> you've yeah, got to get yeah, it out yeah. there. You've got to put it out, and you've yeah. got to market it yourself. But I have a wonderful publicist to, uh, yeah. to help me with, uh, with the marketing. Uh -huh. And uh, that's really great. Mary Ellen's uh, just, been, just been wonderful. And, uh, and, 
and it, it's it's kind of nice because you're you're kind of responsible for all the bits and pieces of it mm. put it out there um, but I you know it's not for everybody yeah. uh, my next book I'm working on one now it's called the draft Dodger it's uh, it's about uh, ultimately it's about the Middle East but it's uh, it has stories that harken back from the 60s when people came to Canada as a refuge from the Vietnam War the draft yeah. of the Vietnam War in the United States yeah. uh, so it, it, it takes us back there over to the Iraq war and then it, it, it ultimately deals with Middle East conflict uh, so and that's in process I, I wrote a play about that first a radio play and, uh, and so I've moved it now into into a book form because I think it's a really good story and I think people will enjoy hearing about it and is it also uh, in a, a Canadian story because yeah it's set in Toronto okay absolutely yeah yeah, yeah I, I kind of like you know doing things the other reason I self-published is of course there are publishers in the US that uh, particularly the vanity publishers who are interested in, in taking the book and publishing it uh, but it's, it's can, this is a Canadian book it's about yeah. Canadian story and it's you know yeah. I, I just feel that you ought to you ought to have it printed and published in Canada yeah mm-hmm. plus would they even be interested down there they well, don't even know about any of that stuff that we all a, went it's through it's a story I've had a few inquiries about a screenplay because it it makes yeah. for a good uh, for good action movie, and um, it seems since it is so Canadian, uh, I would think the CBC would uh, want to speak to you or have you on one of their shows. At I some sure point. hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, May the sixth—that's this Sunday in Burlington—and then you, are you going to be doing anything in Toronto? Uh, I have got that organized yet, uh, okay. but uh, you know, lots of time. There's a lot of things are happening, and I'm also doing a play at the uh, Hamilton Fringe this year. So I'm directing, producing, having written it, and mm. and acting in it, and so I've got that on my schedule. Well, you better as well. tell us what it's called. It's so called the Cooking Show. The Cooking <laughs> Show, and it's a, it's <laughs> oh, it's wow. a t- it's a very funny. It's it's a, it's a, this book is very serious. Excuse me. This book is very serious. The, uh, the the play is extremely funny, and it's a spoof on the uh, on the Food Network. Okay. So, uh, well, that would so be and that's at the Hamilton Fringe. It's at the Hamilton Fringe, which will be running the last two weeks of July. All right, you're gonna bring and, it to Toronto uh, one at some of four point? locations. Two. Well, I, 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 I'm actually thinking about it. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out in Hamilton. Okay. Before oh, we what, like what is that time with the uh, Fringe Festival in Toronto, the Hamilton Fringe? It, the Toronto Fringe is just before it. Okay. I was in the Toronto Fringe in uh, 2010. Okay. Well, well, Ray, this is this has been great to yeah. have this conversation, and uh, looking forward to reading the book. If people want to get in touch with you, uh, maybe to buy the book, or maybe they want to just talk to you about the plays or anything, is there a website or something where there they can is get in touch? the book has its own website? It's called The End of September. www.theendofseptember.com, mm-hmm. uh, and you can reach me directly as uh, RayZRivers at gmail dot com, and I look forward to uh, to communications. Absolutely. Okay. Or you can Google, uh, and you can get me that way too. All right. Okay, Ray. Thank great you. To, great to do this. Thanks for coming in today. Great. Thank you very much for and having there's, me. There's yeah. the Enjoy book. the book. There the go, end yeah. of September. That's what it yeah. looks like. And uh, go out and add this to your Canadian culture I'll collection. Try to. Okay. So we're going to take a little break and uh, we're going to come back uh, with more liquid lunch right after this.